up like wean in it, me and your jeans in it, yeah. yellow like pee in it, yeah. oh no I mean me in it, no it ain't lean in it, uh-huh. but it's got a little pink in it, uh-huh. kinda make you wanna drink in it, got a little cream in it, yeah. but I feel a little bean in it, yeah. work me up like caffeine in it, uh, drippin' like an extra large but the top is too small, yeah. here let me wipe you off, uh-huh. look inside I can't wait to get you home at all, nah these cup holders are small, uh-huh. can't believe what is in it, yeah. tastes like a good time, my brain was foggy in my business, yeah. short term memory fried, brain on, what you got, girl, is tough as shit. Yeah. Can't nothing else fuck with it. Hey. Yeah. Press, please, that fresh squeeze juice. There can never be a supplement. Yeah. I got juice for all my lovers. Got juice for all my wives. Hey. My juice is my religion. Got juice between my thighs. Hey. Now ask the angels, baby. My juice is so divine. Hey. Ain't no juice quite like yours. Ain't no juice quite like mine. Hey. If you try to grab my pussy, got this place to grab you back.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to AI Talk, a Zoom show about AI technology and life. I'm your host, Karen Howe, and we're here today for the second of first five pilot episodes of this show. So if you joined us last week, I'm thrilled that you actually came back. And if you're here for the first time, welcome. We're broadcasting our pilot run every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. EST, and each episode is featuring an incredible guest speaker and a conversation about their work and about their life. Um, this show came out of my personal need to have a little laughter and mental sanity during the times that we're in. It's not an MIT technology review show in case that wasn't clear. So um, you might notice that the production is a little janky or a little glitchy and unpolished at times. And that's because it's just me. There's no team behind me or anything like that. Um, it also means that this is very much a work in progress. So I'll be sending out a survey after every episode and ask you what you did and didn't like. Thank you to the people who tuned in last week and gave me some awesome feedback. Um, it was super helpful. So as with last week, I wanna quickly address Zoom bombing. Um, many of you have probably read about it and we've done what we can on our end to prevent that from happening. If it does end up happening, we'll end the show immediately and Ruman and I will follow up with a recording of the um, episode. We'll do a recording ourselves and send out um, a link to all of the people who registered for this episode. So thank you so much for being willing to experiment with us and hopefully have some fun in the process. Now, without further ado, I am super excited to introduce our guest for today. Ruman Chowdhury is the responsible AI lead at Accenture. Um, but that really does not encapsulate her massive resume. She's also a political scientist, a quantitative social scientist, a data scientist, an AI developer, and one of the most sought after speakers for AI and tech events around the world. Um, and despite her exhausting schedule, she's highly energetic and fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> on your toes with her insights <laughs> mind and quick wit. So Ruman, welcome to the show. Hey, Karen. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Okay, so you do so many things. <laughs> when you need to give people an elevator pitch about what you do, what do you actually say? Uh, I think I, I think I tend to fall on like the quantitative social scientist end. I think it's just me being like stubborn uh, because when I first moved here, it was like 20, 2012, 2013. Um, and I would get questioned a lot as to how I could possibly be a data scientist because I wasn't a programmer. And of course, when you're like a newbie and a baby, you're like, oh, you know, maybe I'm really not. And maybe, and now I'm just like, F that. So I take a lot of pride in calling myself a quantitative social scientist because literally my job relies on me being that. So that'd probably be how I introduce myself. So, okay, yeah. So tell, tell us about your job because you're at Accenture, you basically work with companies and governments to help deploy responsible AI. And what does that actually, what does that look like? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. And, it's, and I learned so much at my job. It's, it's almost, I mean, not that I mind being paid, especially in the current economic climate, um, but it's just like constant entertainment and constant learning. Um, so my job is to actually do client delivery of, a, of responsible AI. So I have to figure out what will actually sell, what will actually have traction in the market. Um, and, you know, what I'd say is like in the beginning, it was just a lot of like awareness raising, a lot of training, education, et cetera. Now it's moved a lot into thinking about governance and governance methodologies and not just like, ah, oh, we need to draft principles, but like, how do we drive principles into action? And that's like, I feel like this is like the 2020 question in responsible AI, right? Is it now we've, how do we prevent ethics washing? Um, how do we drive this up into action? What do we do if we find bias? So um, every year it's like, there's like a new way of framing things or talking about things. And like, you know, my clients have ranged from government to financial services, um, social media giants, um, you know, companies you've heard of and probably a lot of companies you've not heard of. <laughs> you mentioned that you mentioned the whole like ethics washing and moving from principles to practice um, because you've been in this specific role for about three years, right? Yeah, yeah. So I started late January 2017. How, I mean, given the, these three years are probably like you've basically had a front row seat to how the conversation has shifted around responsible AI and ethical mm -hmm. AI. So could you give us a sense of what actually changed in these last three years in addition to um, the, the move towards action. I'm sure that, yeah, that yeah. the way people talk about responsible AI has also substantively changed. Yeah, there's this slide I used to start all of my talks with. Um, um, and if you ever saw one of my talks in like early 2017, like I swear, like every talk, and I'd say there are three things I don't talk about. Um, 
and it's Terminator Hal and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs saving the world. Because <laughs> I swear to God, if we need to have another conversation with like Terminator um, and Beth Singler, who is an AI researcher in the UK, she used to keep like a folder of robot pictures that people would have in media articles. And it's just like, man and God, but oh my God, one of them's a robot. No one's thought of that, right? Uh, and if I saw another like Hal photo, I would have gone bananas. Um, so and what I'd say is like, it's the conversation has gotten more sophisticated, which I really, really like. And people have kind of evolved beyond, and, like, and not to say evolved beyond, it's really good to have the philosophical conversations. But then there's like, you know, it needs to be grounded in the now as well. Um, and I think people have realized that it is not a later conversation, it is a now conversation. There is a difference between AGI and narrow AI, like all of these things that I had to explain, uh, I don't have to. Interestingly, the one talk that it was the first talk I ever wrote, and I still give it, I actually probably gave it like three weeks ago, is this talk that I wrote about bias. And it's what do we talk about when we talk about bias? And like, it goes through how a data scientist thinks about bias versus how like a lay person or a non-data scientist thinks about bias. Mm -hmm. um, and how it becomes this like lost in translation moment as the two groups try to talk to each other. And they use the same word, but they use it from their perspective. Um, and it's like I said, it's the first talk, I, one of the first talks, it's not the first talk I ever wrote, and I still give it today. And people are like, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't really, really think about it that way. Could you give us like the one minute taster version of this? <laughs> yes. The two ways that people actually define bias. Yeah. So to data scientists, bias is uh, often conflated with like an error, not conflated, but it is part of an error term. We teach something called bias variance. It's quantifiable. It's measurable. And actually every model needs bias. Um, and then you think of a lay person and they think of biases isms. So by the, so models need bias to be generalizable, right? To a lay person or non-data scientist, bias is like an ism, like sexism, racism, bias inherently means bad. Uh, whereas even the term discrimination, like the literal sense is to discriminate, to tell between different things. Like it is not, but it doesn't have that normative assessment that you would if you are a non-data scientist. So when data scientists say things like all models need bias, what people hear is, oh my God, all AI is racist or something like that. And that's, that's the loss in translation part. Have you felt um, with the increased nuance and also the increased um, attention to ethics, has that actually made your job easier or has the hype in some ways also made it harder? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot like it's unfortunately one of those things where, you know, a lot of people think you just have like an opinion and that's that's just what makes you like an ethicist and um and maybe i'm a bit of a, a purist on some of the stuff but like literally i would never call myself an ethicist because i don't think i have the appropriate training to do that but then you see people like going around saying oh yeah yeah i'm an expert in ai ethics and because i like have thoughts um <laughs> i read the wiki page on aristotle <laughs> and i'm good plato you know um, that guy. Um, yeah, it, I, actually, I kind of think it's gotten a little bit harder um, because there's been, much like traditional AI hype, there's been like scope creep. Like, I actually know nothing about climate change. Um, I think it is a noble thing to be trying to fix, but actually, like, I, like, to me, responsible AI is something very specific and you know, uh, I may not be the person to talk to and about when, you, when you're wondering about AI and climate change. So it has this like scope creep component where now it's like COVID-19, homelessness, like climate change. And it's like, oh, that's different in my head at least. Um, and then also just like an influx of just like random opinions. Um, and again, like I'm not one to be a gatekeeper, but if you go to a talk and it's like, you know, they're, they're using a HAL or a Terminator slide. <laughs> Uh, or it's just kind of a rehashed opinion of someone you've heard before, you know, you're probably not listening to somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah, that's something that I really struggle with too, because when I cover AI ethics, I think people also assume that I am like, I'm the expert and I'm, and they don't realize that I'm actually just regurgitating, <laughs> interviewing experts and regurgitating opinions. So then, so then people are always like, what's your thought on this? And I'm like, I don't know. You're like, I have thoughts, doesn't mean they're valid thoughts. <laughs> I mean, isn't that kind of a problem in society today anyway, right? Just like, how many more armchair epidemiologists do we need? Like I literally refrain from saying anything about COVID-19 because I'm like, you know what? 
it's not something I know something about. And I'm more than happy to be like, this is not something I know something about and someone else who's smarter than me can talk about it, right? When you go to like the first meeting with a client, is how much of the initial conversation is actually you <laughs> explaining to them like what you can and can't do? Or yeah, like yeah, so interestingly we've done, so we, we, so this year I've focused a lot on training people at Accenture to do responsible AI work. Um, we've trained over 200 since November. It would be higher, frankly, but because of COVID-19 we had to stop our trainings. They were like two day intensives. Um, and like, I was trying to make as many as possible. Um, if not like people I really trusted were doing the training. Um, but actually we have a slide on what responsible AI is not. So we say, what is it? And then what it is not. And even defining what it is, like I define it a very particular way. I think other, because I'm thinking about it from like an applied business perspective, it can mean other things to other people. So I think it always helps to like level set and frame. So you recently, um, actually did a study about how organizations can actually move from principles to practice. So can you talk about that? And I'm going to drop the link of your study in this chat. Yeah. Um, so if you were at FACT, formerly known as Fat Star in Barcelona earlier this year, um, you saw a member of my team, uh, Bobby Rakova, who's been really the one doing like the vast majority of this work um, uh, on this project, uh, alongside Jingying Yang um, from Partnership on AI and Henriette Kramer from Spotify Labs. And the question we wanted to answer is like, what are the organizational enablers of adopting you know, a responsible uh, AI or, or the practices of, you know, developing and deploying your AI responsibly. Um, what was really cool is the perspective we took was more about um, like or organizational change management. So what are the things that help organizations make big shifts? So we relied very heavily on um, like organizational change literature, that kind of thing. Um, if you ever went to business school, there's like massive, really interesting literature on that kind of thing. Um, so we did 25 interviews with people whose jobs are you know somehow similar to mine that like and bobby's like we are part of delivering and creating responsible ai not not doing the research side of it uh more on the applied side um and we came up with like four key factors uh in our ethnographic study like there was kind of a an overview so the the first is um, I'm looking at my notes on that screen, so I keep looking over there. <laughs> it's like, write this down. No, it's, it's, it's really cool. Like, it's really interesting work because, again, this is going back to the, like, moving from principles to practice concept. Like, we have to do the same in our, in our own organizations. So the first is the when and how do we act, which kind of ties into, like, where in the organization do you sit? Like, how close are you to leadership? Um, who thought of your role? Is it like, you know, some intrepid data scientist was like, we need to be ethical? Or is it like something like mine, where literally like the C-suite was like, we need to hire a role like this and let's go find somebody. Those two things are just very different in your ability to take action uh, within your own organization. Mm -hmm. um, the second theme is how do we measure success? And, you know, people talk a lot about performance KPIs around ethics and fairness and human well-being, but individuals, like we also need KPIs around this work. So for a lot of folks, this was like a plus one to their day job. So they're actually not being measured on creating ethical products. And if they're working with other teams, their KPIs may actually be around other things like productivity or how many projects you want, et cetera. And this might actually make them look bad. Um, so, so how can we expand concepts of performance indicators, et cetera, to measure a positive impact on the organization. Third is what are the internal structures we rely on? So again, like where do you fit in the organization? Who do you work with? Like, do you have like leadership buy-in? Um, you know, if something bad, you know, if the kind of leading to the last one, like how do we resolve tensions? So when there is a disagreement, how, how does that get resolved? Like who has the authority? In some sense, it's actually really good that my job is to sell this business because often um, if, you know, if you're in a role where what you do is kind of a nice to have or it's not seen as contributing to core business functions, then it's easy to drop. Like I can say things like, you know, if not that I've really ever had to, but if I needed to, I could say something like, well, you know, if this unethical project moves forward, you're going to impact my ability to sell business because we're going to make me not credible, like on behalf of Accenture, right? Yeah. So the ability to say things like that's really important. So figuring out like where an individual sits in a hierarchy, what ability do we have to resolve tension? So a really great example is, you know, a lot of people are trying to do algorithmic audits. And the thing with audits is like, 
a lot of this is very wishful thinking still in most organizations, right? Where I can point out the things that are going wrong or that need to be fixed, but it is often ultimately up to the, you know, whoever the management is leading this product to decide they want to implement it. And if you do not have their buy-in, you frankly don't usually have authority. Um, I often work with my legal counterparts a lot because they're really amazing at having to navigate this world, but also they hold a lot of clout. If you come at them, like not that I threaten people with legal, but like if legal is contacting them, it may be viewed very, very differently than like some person in the organization who has decided to take this upon themselves. Yeah. Um, we actually had a question from the audience, which Ooh, audience. other people from the audience that want to ask questions, please do. We also have an AMA at the end. Um, this is from Helen Edwards. Is, uh, if so, <laughs> what's selling at the moment? Um, what do you think is the best way to add ethics to standard software development processes? Mm, um, so to the second one, I'll point to another similar and also a, and very good paper that just was published. It was Hannah Wallach and a bunch of other folks, I think Hal Domey and some other folks are on it. And it asked, it asked a really similar question, but it, on like, how can you drive this organizational change? But uh, theirs was more of like a, how do we help you resolve your pain points? Um, and they had this, uh, you know, sort of feedback about creating these checklists, although I wish it was a better word than checklist. Um, and maybe this is just like a personal thing. Uh, to a lot of engineering folks, checklists are often just like rote, like you do a thing and you don't think about it. Whereas I think the checklist, even as they meant it, were meant to have a lot of critical thinking and reflection in it. Um, but I, I think it's a step in the right direction. So in terms of like integrating these processes, I think one, we're gonna see a lot of standards and laws passing. So for one, it's going to be either a legal requirement or at the very least, you'll have a standard documentation to point to, to say, hey, these are the IEEE standards, so we can just adopt these. And those will probably be coming like this year, early next year, so I think that'll help you know, anyone who's trying to do this internally quite a bit. Uh, as to what's selling, um, my biggest clients are in financial services and government. Uh, financial services, actually, uh, it's, now that I, I understand uh, the kind of work they do, it's actually very unsurprising. And I've been so pleasantly surprised by uh, uh, learning a bit more about, like, the Financial Conduct Authority and, and like in the UK and all these groups that, that do this work and the entire field of financial risk management is actually, you know, comes out of um, the 2008 crisis. And I just did like a talk I think last week or two weeks ago uh, with uh, Mona Sloan and some other folks that she was leading. It, it was an NYU um, IPK talk and we were talking about AI and finance and uh, I can give the link later, but you know, the other, um, guests like were, were historians of finance. It was really interesting to trace this back to the 2008 crisis. Anyway, so the whole field of risk management is kind of built around like stress testing models, understanding how models can fall apart. So they already have like model risk management processes. And so banks are like really well set up. If I were to give my rubric on how I think about responsible AI and who a good client is, like number one, they think about AI as like a statistical and not a deterministic output, like a probabilistic output, because then you can understand how it could go wrong and where biases can come in. I don't have to explain math to you then. Uh, so that would be a good one. Number two is um, a highly regulated industry, um, not just because they're worried about regulation, actually it's because they have the right legal infrastructure to really think about these problems and address them. Because a lot of organizations don't even have the right internal infrastructure, even if they're well-meaning. Um, GDPR forced a lot of them to start making these infrastructures, but banks have already have like risk officers, for example, who think about this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the third is frankly the money to do it, because right now, like none of this is mandated by law a lot, but in, in some cases it can be, but you really have to have a very forward thinking leadership um, that really wants to invest in this kind of thing. Um, we had another question, or we, well, first question, is, does anyone have a link to the paper? I will send out a link to uh, like a document of all of the things that we mention as we talk in the conversation. Um, and then another question from Victor, what do you think about value alignment as one of the pathways in building ethical and responsible AI? I think I need a better definition. Of, I hear that term a lot, but I don't want to pretend like I 100% understand what it means. The value alignment. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. And I don't mean that in like a negative way. I just mean like, 
I think I have my interpretation, but I'm not, it's kind of like design thinking and like there is like what it's supposed to be and then what it is <laughs> where it's just like, I got some sticky notes. <laughs> And you're like, oh, but like people who really do design led thinking, like it is a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so I cannot claim to be like a value alignment expert, uh, but I would love any clarity on what value alignment is supposed to be. If you want to comment back in the box. Um, relatedly, when you were doing your study, so you, you interviewed like a lot of different organizations for the study. Were you impressed by any particular organization um, and did you f find them like having all of the different characteristics that you ultimately um, synthesized as like the gold standard? Um, I, I think no organization is there yet. Like even even the ones that we would might even point at as being the ones that clearly like have all their stuff together, like have some of the people we all look up to, et cetera. Uh, everyone is trying to figure it out. Um, so I think if you are your organization, you feel like you're struggling or you're hitting a wall, like realize that a lot of folks are in the same place. Um, not, you know, not in any sort of a negative or bad way, but just because like this field is only a few years old. There's no way. We don't even know yet really what all the problems even are, let alone what all the solutions are. Yeah. Um, I have just one more question and then yeah. I wanted to- I was going to say, can we time box the boring stuff and get yeah, to the Yeah, I know, stuff? I know. We need to do more fun things, but I, I have one more question all right, all right. on regulation because you brought up this whole thing about how GDPR was like really important to pushing a lot of organizations forward and the EU in general has been a leader in um, really pushing forward data ethics regulation, AI regulation. And yeah. recently there was a Financial Times article about how um, basically because of coronavirus, the EU is starting to question whether some of their initial strategies around this were the right ones because they originally advocated for things like data sovereignty, like um, using only European data to train European AI algorithms, and now they're realizing that some of these things actually slow down the um, ability of scientists to advance science for against uh, for fighting the pandemic. Um, so I, I was just curious, like it, with that topic, like mm -hmm. how you've been, if you've been thinking at all about just um, the way that the pandemic has kind of highlighted some of the challenges that um, AI ethics and data privacy advocates have been grappling with. That's a, that was a very nebulous question. So. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's a really good one. I think um, what's, what's really struck me, it's so interesting, like, like I said in the beginning, I was like, look, I am not an expert in any of this stuff. Uh, I'm not even going to be talking, but I think it, in the last week, I've noticed a shift because people are going from like crisis mitigation mode into like an adding this future planning mode, like, all right, like what is the structures we built, da, da, da. Um, and like, there's a lot, like a lot of like regulators, who I probably, I, I can't name, uh, are thinking very deeply on this, <laughs> uh, on this data and privacy balance. And the thing is like, these are not like new questions, right? It is just taking the questions uh, and shoving them in our faces. And this has sort of been the theme in tech ethics, right? Like AI ethics or tech ethics in general. It's like, actually none of the questions we raise are new. This has always been about like bias and discrimination, racism, institutional, like these are not new questions. Yeah. Uh, this technology just shoves it in our face. And in the pandemic, I think a lot of the questions that privacy folks or privacy buffs maybe even had even almost a more theoretical sense. It's like, oh, wait, this isn't theoretical anymore. Like we literally have to triage bodies. We literally have to think about how to track and trace people. Yeah. Um, but what I found interesting is I would say like the big comparison people tend to make is the U.S. post 9-11. Um, what is interesting is in the U.S. post 9-11, if you're old enough to like remember, you could not say anything bad about any tracking or tracing or whatever. Like you couldn't say anything bad about the PhD. Like you were like un-American. You know, the fact that we are even in a world right now where you can question, um, you know, these structures is frankly like different from the way it was. So what, one thing I'd say that is, I suppose on the optimistic side is we're even allowed to, we're even open enough to have these conversations in a place we weren't 20 years ago. Um, and in part because of all the great work that folks have been doing to raise issues of uh, the ethical considerations and privacy. And, and I would say like the privacy folks have been working at this the longest, so they deserve the credit for that one. Okay, so there's like more questions, but I'm, I'm gonna wait for the AMA to okay. go to those questions because I wanna play a game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I was, 
prom is fun. Not that it's not fun. I know, I know. <laughs> I was like, I got really caught like, up. I have like <laughs> all my like gear, like, that is, that is our job. I have like all my random stuff ready for all the, all the, the, the itinerary <laughs> we discussed. <laughs> okay, so we're going to play a game called Hot or Not. Can okay. I screen? <laughs> So, Ramon, you're going to decide whether you approve of something, and this week that thing is Steakums. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, Steakums um, is a Philadelphia, or, or Pennsylvania-based processed meat brand, mm. and this is, this is relevant. It's been in the news in the last two weeks because it's turned out. Uh, turned into somewhat of a breakout star by tweeting out highly nuanced and thoughtful opinions about misinformation. Um, so much so I mean, wait, can, can i pause and say isn't the concept of steakums misinformation i because well, like it's i mean times. saying oscar Mayer it's weird media. times right now Ramon. <laughs> so like one of the like the, these are really good like friendly reminder in times of uncertainty and misinformation anecdotes are not data good data is carefully measured and collected information da, 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 da. so like these no, are I mean, like, extremely really, well thought through i really yeah well so like earned them a Wall Street Journal article. <laughs> so, like, my question to you is... I'm just, I'm just trying to think, like, who photoshopped that picture? Like, whose job was, like, what intern oh, yeah. no, the, was the, the, given the, this the, task? The, like, hey, find a stock photo of executive and put this box of steak on The caption on the photo in this article literally was, <laughs> steak has a paltry marketing budget. <laughs> That was the caption on this photo. Um, I, I saw some tweet where they traced the guy who who's been who's like yeah no the, there's there's like this yeah there's this guy who um, he's he's like the writer of the social media account yeah. um, and I so the Wall Street Journal article actually gives like some context into this um, which might help you answer whether this this brand is hot or not. Um, Apparently, the tweets are actually part of their broader marketing strategy. So in 2017, the brand's Twitter handle started doling out random bits of social commentary to regain popularity among young consumers. So this is actually a thing that they've been doing for a while. I think they just- Were they trying to like be like a Wendy's? They pivoted to misinformation, um, yeah. but they use it as free publicity because they don't yeah, have I'm sure. a marketing budget. And I think it's smart. I mean, yeah, I mean, we are in the era of the Instagram celebrity, right? Like you yeah. actually need, if you're, if you're clever, like you actually need very little marketing budget. And frankly, like if it is over marketed, um, it seems disingenuous. So like, okay, let, let's, let's balance. Let's like do this semi-scientifically, shall we? <laughs> so like steakums, like I have never consumed a steakum in my life. Um, do not know how they taste. <laughs> You know, like so so th there is the questionable component of like this is literally frozen processed meat like you couldn't get me like 10 like you couldn't get me anywhere near a can of spam or like vienna sausages right so do we how do we balance that with the 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 actually like i was gonna say the wokeness but i use that term as a joke but like the like the actually like thoughtful information they're putting out there right it's like, um on one hand yeah. educating people on the other hand on the other hand getting misinformation education from us. <laughs> but I, I will i will throw in like who am i to say anything about processed food consumption given the like bags of hot cheetos that currently reside <laughs> in my apartment <laughs> therefore <laughs> By default, I have to vote hot. <laughs> you have to vote hot. I have. Like, who am I to judge steakums with, like, literally the amount of junk food I've consumed in the past few weeks? Like, uh, yeah, like, everyone's been baking sourdough. Like, I've been rediscovering, like, Aunt Jemima and Bisquick. I'm all about it. I, I, I made I made like I made chicken pot pie a la like Betty Draper. It was like it was like you know canned Campbell soup and uh, chicken and frozen vegetables covered in biscuit. It was delicious. So <laughs> I'm like this close to a steak. -um. Okay, one thing that I've been like really curious about for for you is you were literally traveling an insane amount and. <laughs> one of the things that I used to think about when I had a really intense travel schedule was like, oh, it's not as bad as Ruman's. <laughs> this was like literally You're a it. thought. So like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing in quarantine now? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh my God. I'm like loving not being jet lagged. So like, 
this is like the like the most with it I've been. I feel like in a while. Because seriously, like I lived in a state of like I used to joke that like I, that there is a, a world called post jet lag where you're just forever jet lag. So there is no like normal schedule you go back to. It is it's take it literally took like months. Um, but I've gotten back to like a normal sleep, semi normal. I I sleep terribly anyway, but like a semi normal sleep wake schedule. Uh, I am like like true like my I'm in like my true form actually I'm like by nature like a complete introvert which I realize like does not seem like it but I actually am uh so I'm like I'm loving it like I like get my pets um I have my switch I got my toys I got all of my things I love to watch <laughs> I'm like I'm good <laughs> I, I like when I, yeah, so it's like a shocker to me that you're an introvert, <laughs> but people also tell me that they're, they're shocked when I tell them that I'm an introvert. Um, but literally when like you haven't tweeted in a while and I literally was like, Are you okay? Okay? I'm like, actually, I've just not been on Twitter and it's kind of nice. <laughs> oh, we got, we got. <laughs> Someone just posted the Betty Cracker recipe. So much no, it's it's like legit a this quick recipe too. Like I, I'm gonna say, like I'm gonna go on record and say that I've been reliving the food of the '80s, and you know what? It's actually pretty damn good. Don't anybody tell you otherwise? <laughs> Duncan Hines chocolate cake with funfetti frosting, damn good. This quick, damn good. Aunt Jemima pancake mix, the best. <laughs> That's amazing. Um. <laughs> I want to talk about your switch because <laughs> oh, I already saw a question about Animal Crossing. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, open, I'm gonna turn on my switch. I got a little, I got a little peek on here. So, so, so you, I, you I weren't like, familiar, I yeah. Crossing was so I'm, I'm gonna assume that there might be some people, um, who don't know what Animal Crossing is. <laughs> Um, all right, all right. And actually, I have I have some visual aids. I have some visual oh, aids. Visual aids. Oh, I do. God. See, this is Tom Nook. This is a Tom Nook amiibo. How do you have um, in your house? So this is an amiibo. This is like, a, a you're hearing the Animal Crossing music in the background, by the way, which is sort of like 70s elevator music. It is so soothing. <laughs> it's perpetually stuck in loop on my head. And it's great. Because I'm like, do 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 do. Well, okay, so Animal Crossing is right. the Switch game. Animal Crossing is a Switch game. So this uh, this little this little dude, he's a Tanuki, uh, which is sort of like this raccoony thing. Um, his name is Tom Nook, and he's sort of the proprietor. Uh, so this this version is called Animal Crossing New Horizons. It is one of a series of games in Animal Crossing. It is a Sims game, like a simulated world, and you you can make an avatar for yourself, but everyone else in it is basically an animal. Um, that's why it's called Animal Crossing. And the objective of the game, like most sim games, like there really isn't one. Like you have to like, you know, build a place and make it nice and whatever. So the general theme behind this is like, there's this island and you are one of the first inhabitants of this deserted island and you're gonna go and like make it a nice place to live. So Tom Nook is the guy who is like, he's like the VC behind the whole thing. <laughs> he funded the whole thing. Uh, so you start off in debt to this man. <laughs> He, uh, this Tanuki like hands you a phone and he's like, hey, welcome to the island. Here's a Nook branded phone. By the way, you owe me $5,000 or like bells. Um, Wait, this so is where it starts to become like a capitalist nightmare. <laughs> for more context, like before we introduce your theory, we should <laughs> Ron's crackpot theories has become incredibly popular during the pandemic because it's supposed to be really calming. And I it have, like, is. It's also say. like your only social interaction with people. Like, so the whole point, actually, so what I do like about the game is it, the, the objective is actually like meeting people and interacting with them. So like, for example, and they sort of, you know, make it, make, make you kind of have to. So you have an island and your island grows a particular kind of fruit. My island grew cherries, but you get more money or like bells if you are selling fruit that's not native to your island. So what you do is you make friends and like you go to your friend's islands and like, you know, my friend Emily, the native fruit to her island is, let's say, like oranges. I'm like, hey, Emily, here's a cherry, and you can now plant cherry trees. And she gives me oranges, I plant orange trees, right? And there's like this whole, like, it's meant to be collaborative. Um, so, like, you can actually just hang out with people in Animal Crossing. This is really interesting, actually. So, it's really hard to like. So, a few people who have um, Animal Crossing, uh, Chris Collard, who you probably know is hyper visible. Um, I, I'll, I'll start throwing a Twitter handle, it's a not real name. Someone's like, who? Twitter hyper visible. Oh, that guy. So, like, Rat King, uh, Nick Seaver, <laughs> uh, NP Seaver, 
um, and a few people who work for me. And so now I, uh, <laughs> I, I have been known to maybe once or twice hold a meeting <laughs> where we're both on our switches. Hey, Emily. And the, we were just like, hey, so let's talk about work, but then also like come visit my island and check out like my dope house. Okay, we, we have a question from Peter. <laughs> Has anyone broached the issue of responsibly using AI to harvest bells or collapse virtual markets in Animal Crossing? This can is can we really talk about the theory. stock market? There's a market that absolutely needs to be addressed. Yeah, <laughs> so, stock so, S-T-A-L-K. Okay, yes. Yeah. So there, so like, as I mentioned, the whole point of this game is you go and like, throughout your, you start off in a tent and you kind of build a house and you build a whole community and you have to get people to live on the island and plant trees, you know, it's sort of like a simulated world game, right? Um, and like, they'll be introduced these new characters and like stuff will happen to kind of keep you entertained. So every week on a Sunday, there's this little cute little piggy girl who's a bit of a, a bit of an Asian stereotype, like, mm, you know, there's also a camel that sells carpets. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this like, no, but literally like, and she's super cute, though. but she like, you know, she does the little like Thai thing and the basket on her head and she's selling these turnips, right? So the whole point of these turnips is that it, it's literally teaching you, teaching children, because presumably it's a game for children, <laughs> um, teaching children like how like market speculation works. So you buy these turnips at a particular price and every single day uh, in the store, there is a price for turnips. And theoretically, like you wanna buy low, sell high. However, what happened last week was uh, I bought turnips at 98 bells and it never went back up. So, all, and oh, and your turnips spoil in a week. So my turnips spoiled. I'm like, what kind of game is this for children? Like, what are we teaching children here? They're like, you know what, the world is an unfair place. Uh, so if there's a market that needs to be disrupted, it is it is the stock market. You know what this actually sounds this sounds like Neopets. Oh, it's Neopets a lot like Neopets. Too, back in the day. Yeah, no, it's it's actually what's really interesting is I've seen a few people, especially women, posting, they're like, Oh, I'm not really a gamer, but and I'm like, this is a game. Why wouldn't you like like what what do y'all think like a gamer like okay, like like real talk, like if you've ever played like Witcher or like any of these games, like you do similar things, like you ride through the woods, you like maybe kill an animal, but like like it's very similar and there are these kind of objectives, but like I think people think a quote gamer plays these like first person shooter games, but like Neopets, totally a valid game. <laughs> Animal Crossing, Stardew Valley, totally valid games. Right? Like, I'm serious. Like, I find it very odd that people are like, I'm not really a gamer. But then they've, like, created this insane world in Animal Crossing, which is, like, similar in tasks. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, sidebar. Um, we have a massive list of questions. <laughs> I feel like I should move like, le like, let's get Ramon's weird yeah. takes on things. <laughs> okay. So the conspiracy one, theories. The first one from, from a couple minutes ago from Jonathan Stray. I'm very curious, what is in scope of responsible AI for you? Mm, great question. question. Yeah. So I define it to be, like, four pillars. Um, uh, technical... Um, organizational, operational, and reputational. Um, and what I have realized, like not that I'm an expert in risk management, that what the way I had framed it was actually very aligned to risk frameworks. Um, so technical approaches, think about things like explainability, bias detection, like how do you like look at a model and do this stuff? And I think in the early days of responsibly, I, like a lot of us thought of it that way, like auditing like a specific model, like this, you know, thing, this technique. Um, or like operational is really about like governance methodologies, which a lot of us have talked about last year. Like how do you create the right kind of infrastructure to organization? Operational is like how do you enable your workforce to take action on this? Like what are the things you need to have in place? Um, <clears throat> and reputational is literally like how do you talk to people about the AI that you have built? Because in the other flip side of like the AI hype is like, the AI fear, which is also sometimes overhyped, like somebody can create something really simplistic. I was like, oh, it's an AI, it's going to be terrible, right? And it's not necessarily, and especially if they've been thoughtful. So how, so for example, one of my clients built um, uh, like a model to like in, in the realm of like employment, right? So their big concern was like, oh, everyone's like knee jerk reaction is, oh, all AI and hiring is biased. And, you know, they're like, well, we genuinely 
have done, like we think we've done the work necessary, how do we then communicate this to people? Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, so we help them think through their communication strategy, by the way, not just to like the public, but also to their employees, right? Yeah. So how do you communicate in a way that's not like weird and creepy? <laughs> Okay, next question from Maximilian. When you talk to and work with clients in government, how high up um, the list of their priorities is responsible AI? Um, I think that varies quite a bit by like, you know, like where this government is, the values, right, of that, of that country or even that literally that office that you're in. Hmm. Um, So for example, like the city of New York is hiring for an algorithmic management policy officer. It's not the first kind of role in in the entire world that does that. Um, They've also, city of New York has passed a law saying that any AI being used in hiring as of 2022 has to undergo a bias check um, and they have to notify an applicant that an uh, automated decision-making system is used. Mm -hmm. A similar bill about automated decision-making system audit is on the floor in the California state legislature right now. So I think like some places are really forward thinking. A lot of my clients are in Europe, unsurprisingly. Um, but I think in the U.S. more and more people are thinking through like the audit. I, I will say like I think I see it a little bit more at the state and local level um, in the U.S. Just because like the federal level, it's just, it's just really big and kind of it can be kind of messy sometimes. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions? Um, what are some of the advantages, benefits of approaching data science from a quantitative social science perspective rather than a computational physics perspective? Mm. Um, well, I can't really speak to computational physics, but I think sometimes, and this was kind of what I was alluding to when I say um, understanding AI or like machine learning output as being probabilistic rather than deterministic. It's really like understanding that it's math put into code rather than code that executes. Um, so like if it's pure code, it just works or it doesn't work. And, you know, like there's the term GIGO, right? Which absolutely applies in this case, but sometimes to understand where bias can come in or you know where machines can be irresponsible and it's not even the machine right um it's important to understand that this is math it is a model and back when i used to teach data scientists like i had a slide where i would just literally like talk about the term model for a bit right and it's like why do we call this a model like it is you know i had this picture of like derek zoolander <laughs> um but you know like it is it is a representation right and like to like like and again like i'm just gonna stats nerd out for a second but like George Box of like the like I didn't realize he's the same guy that did the the Box Cox kind of uh, like way of like mapping your um, variance um, like it's it's a type of variance plot. Um, he's the one that said like uh, all all models are wrong and some models are useful and that's really important, right? So we think about the term model like it's not going to be a hundred percent correct. In fact, if it were, we'd live in a really effing depressing place because that means we have no free will. Yeah. So like. By de- like, if you think it through, like logically, by definition, this thing has to have some sort of like fungibility. Um, and I think it's easier to understand, again, actually why I get along with finance people so well, like a lot of these quants are like statisticians who moved into this role. So these are not like these magical deterministic, ooh, what's in the black box kind of thing. They're just like, this is some sort of a math and maybe we're not like understanding all the parts that are doing, but it's not 100% like guaranteed output. Yeah, um, we have totally blown past our time. Yeah, no, we totally did. <laughs> <laughs> but it should I, be an hour. I'm like, dang, four you know. minutes. Like, do you know how much I talk? Like, <laughs> there's like so many, so many more things that I like want to say, but I feel like <laughs> the fact that people have. I mean, look, I put on makeup for the first time in like who knows how long. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining us for the second episode. Um, please come back for three, four, and five, um, sign up for the event, right? I will send out a link to all of the different papers that we talked about so that you have it in your place. And once we process the recording, it'll also be sent to your inboxes. So thank you again for joining us and stay healthy. Take care.